believe. And so he got so upset. He said, you, you betrayed my family, you betrayed your community, you betrayed your religion. Uh, you are supposed to have consequences for this. But now, since you choose this, now I get you away from the family. Uh, always uh, insulting when they pass you, spitting on the ground. Oh, occasionally I've been spitted on. I'm Ayla uh, from Kenya, and I'm persecuted uh, for my faith. Well, I grew up in, uh, in northern Kenya, and basically majority Muslim community. So I grew up uh, as a Muslim, and uh, I went to the mosque, and uh, I practiced my faith that way, and going to the afternoon to study uh, Quran. I went to the teacher of, of the madrasa and I asked him, uh, you know, who is this God? And uh, obviously he, he wondered because nobody has ever asked him that question. I wanted to have a personal relationship uh, with God. I learned that I had a numerous attempt trying to do good things so that I can have my good work balance my other bad works. But even with all these attempts, I always failed. And so that was struggle. Then how can I get to paradise with my good, with my works? Because it's never good. I went to a school in the, uh, far up in the, in the board, on the border. And uh, we had uh, a Christian teacher. I didn't like him because we have different faith. I didn't want to, uh, to meet Christians or I didn't want it because growing up, I've been told so much negative about Christians. Uh, there was an outbreak of uh, malaria and yellow fever that killed people in the town. So I, becomes also, I became also very sick. And uh, since I had cerebral malaria, I was almost dying. And so this teacher heard about my condition because I was his student, the only person who came to see me and sitting next to me is a Christian teacher that I didn't like. And so we had a conversation, but before he left, he asked me a question. And the question is, Ibrahim Ali, which is my Muslim name, if you die today, where will you spend your eternity? The, the easy question for me was, Inshallah. It's like, Allah knows. I don't know. But he said, I can tell you. And I said, I don't want to be a Christian. And I don't need to be a Christian. Because to be a Christian in my context means change your name, change your culture, uh, pick other people's religious lifestyle. And I'm, I wasn't ready for that. He told me, you don't need to be a Christian for your sins to be forgiven. So for the first time in my life, I had sins cannot only be recorded and kept on the scale of truth, but it can be forgiven, things that I've never had in my life. And, and so I told him, uh, I'll think about it. Of course, he left that day. But when he left, there was voice in my ears that night that says your sins can be forgiven. For many, many couple nights and days, I couldn't sleep because of this voice. So he came back after a couple of days and straight away, you know, when he came, he asked me, how, uh, what do you think about what we shared last week? Uh, at least I wanted forgiveness of sin, so I'm dying, so that I can die and go and meet my creator to paradise without sin, because I had no hope in the scale of, uh, of truth. And so that way, uh, he said, by confessing your sin and uh, to God and by praying. And, and so he prayed with me. And that very night, I felt the burden and the fear of death left me. And that way I knew that my sins has forgiven and I feel liberty and freedom. I secretly became a secret believer 
kept on going to the mosque, or I grew up knowing that I have a role in the community, but at the same time, uh, I have a role uh, of having a faith in expression of my beliefs. I couldn't uh, come into public, I didn't tell anyone because I was afraid of that. I had this, my uh, uh, Gideon Bible, small pocket Bible, that I always gi given to me by the teacher, and I kept it, and I put it under the mattress. So one day it rained, I couldn't keep it, so my mom found it out, and she took it away, because she didn't want my dad to know. A few months later on, there's a group of Christians meeting for fellowship. I went inside there, they saw me, but there's one of the people who are in the fellowship who knew my dad. So the following morning when he went to the place of work, he met my dad and he said, oh, I'm so excited. Your son came to visit us. My dad couldn't believe. And so he got so upset and finally I broke the news to them that I believed and my sins were forgiven. There was such a peace in me. I don't know how I got that boldness. But of course I knew the consequences. But my teachers already told me that if you confess me before the people, I will confess you before the Father. And he will put words in your mouth on what to say. And uh, when I explained to him, he said, I can't believe, because it's always a shame in our family. Nobody has ever been followers of Jesus in our family, not anybody in, in the community, but how could this be? And so he felt the Christian teacher must have brainwashed me. So the following uh, day in the evening, People came from the, uh, from the mosque at night after evening prayers, and they were asking me, interrogating me. So the following day, they gave me young people to play on a cassette player recitations so that they can get the brainwash out of me. For sure, I knew it wasn't brainwashing. I know my sins are forgiven, and it was very clear for me. And then therefore, in the evening, when they realized I was not giving up on that, the family members came. And now the pressure was on my dad. He said, you, you betrayed my family, you betrayed your community, you betrayed your religion. Uh, you are supposed to have consequences for this. But now, since you choose this, now I get you away from the family you live. You choose between us and your new religion. And I didn't want to lose that. I didn't want to lose my family. But I know my sins have been forgiven. So he forced me to walk away. Don't take anything, go away. So that's how I left. I also had fear that now I'm going, uh, walking into darkness. I don't know where I'm heading to, but I left. I couldn't give up on faith. I was convicted. And so I wanted to pursue the conviction. And I was only 14 years old. And uh, when I left, there was a, a Christian policeman that uh, I knew. He was from other parts of the country, so I went to his place, he kept me for the night. He was also threatened, so he took me to, to his brother's place in another town. And that is how I, I, I left home, and that's exactly what happened to me. That's how I was separated from my family for eight years. So I even finished high school away from home. They even changed my name. My name is Ibrahim Ali but they refused to register me for national examination. And they, that's why I used the name today, Isla. There was a lot of insults. There is a lot of name calling, uh, always uh, insulting when they pass you, spitting on the ground. Oh, occasionally I've been spitted on. I lived uh, in, in, uh, uh, in prayer, uh, not in hatred. I had just a peace and I did not have the fear of death that life is more than just physical living. Now, of course, physically I will be pained and all those things, but I had hope in eternity. That was my motivation of continue through following Jesus. I kept on praying. Secondly, I kept on loving. Even if I was hurt by what they did to me, I knew that it's only love that can change them. And I looked for ways to try to engage, although it was very difficult to kind of build a relationship back with them. But that was very difficult. But part of praying and loving, even in absentia, uh, was very important to me. So I'd finished the school and uh, I went to pray and it was uh, in a forest. I asked God, show me what you want to do with my life. 
suddenly the environment around me changed. And I started sensing the presence of God. And I got so scared that I would feel his presence around me. Suddenly, I went into a revelation. There was something, God brought something like a slide in front of my eyes. But on this, God will bring the people who persecuted me. I would see the face of this guy in the mouth, the Imam, and he said, forgiving and bless him. Then he would go. Then my father's face, my sister, as I pray for them and I bless them and forgive them, bitterness would leave me. We want revenge. You did this to me, then I do the same to you to pain you. That's human. And so forgiveness is not easy. That's why we need the Spirit of God to help us to go through that process of forgiveness through the perspective of God's love who forgave us, who forgave us while we are yet sinners. Forgiveness helped me more than helping them because it had me released. If you do not forgive them, you will not have had to pray for them. You will not pray for your persecutor, you have to pray, it's biblical. After 13 years of my prayer, my mom had an encounter with Jesus. Um, she was a cancer patient, very, became sick, she was taken to the National Hospital. But one day, she was half asleep, uh, somebody came to her in the ward, in the hospital, and gave her a candle, candle, and told her never walk in darkness again, walk in the light. So when my mom woke up, the person was not there. The whole night, she was thinking, you know, somebody came and gave me the candle and told me not to walk in darkness again. This must be Jesus, and I want to walk in the light. So my dad heard about that, then he excommunicated my mom, although she was sick. So he never came to, to see her, although he didn't like her because she stayed with me after that. He thought I have changed her and she followed me in. So in my culture, he wouldn't, he wouldn't allow his wife to die away from home. And, and so he came to pick, her, to pick her and he took her home. The last few months that she lived in that condition, my mom kept on testifying to the villagers, to my family about Jesus. She died on Tuesday. That Sunday, my dad went to the church, a small church planted by my disciple and gave his life to Jesus. And this is what he said. He said, I have seen how she lived for the last few months. She had such a hope and joy, even if she was paining and she never complained. And I myself want to have that hope and joy. So my dad has to go through also his own experience of persecution now. He used to persecute all of us. Now he had to go through his neighbors. They denied things in the community, he can't get access to things. Uh, even when they cook, like in, in our community, they cook food and neighbors would come and eat. They, they didn't want to eat the food from our home because he said he's now an infidel. So he had to go all through those kind of things. But because they believe as a family, they stood together and, and they keep on keeping on. Is he still a strong follower of Jesus today? The weeks that is coming, I kept intensively seeking God's face and heart and praying. God showed me that in the same desert of northern Kenya lived 14 tribes that has no gospel. And that desert is a desert between my town, Marsabit, and the town where I accepted the Lord. I saw cabbage growing in the desert, coming out of the ground. And then I, I see the inscriptions of Isaiah 43, uh, verses 18, verses that says, Forget the former things. Behold, I will do new things. I will cause the rivers to flow in the desert. And I felt it's upon me. Why? Because my tribe is one of the desert. I speak most of the languages. I come from the, the same area. And God saying, I will say, but once I realized that I have a calling, I said, God, I'm not going back. They persecuted me. They will not accept me. Finally, uh, I feel this burden, so I had to go back to the same town where I accepted the Lord, and that's where I started a small church. We built a small shelter, like a church building where we had. When we were praying, they, 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 they stoned it. 
So when I started, it's all the time breaking, where we are meeting, always attacking, several times destroyed. And so we started meeting from house to house and hiding uh, from the scripture for us that he will build his church. It's not our church, it is his church, and God has a way to build his church. Even when it is hurting, at the end of it, there is an encouragement from the word of God. So the word of God became a key foundation of our faith, where many of the first believers that I disciple were physically attacked. Uh, some in the hospital, went to the hospital, houses burned. Uh, so I went through all those types of discrimination in the communities, a young man. A young man had also a vision of Jesus. His community is 100% people of the other faith. And, and at night, in his dream, he saw Jesus, but he didn't know what to do, but he heard that I was uh, a believer of that kind of background. And so when I came to him, I listened to his story, he said, this is what he told me, to go and find somebody who can tell me more. Please, can you share me more uh, uh, about Jesus with me? His name is Hussein. So I started teaching him and sharing with him. So through this process, he accepted Jesus. But his family heard about this. And when his family heard about this, they severely persecuted him, kicked him out, all kinds of things. They even physically hurt him. To be a follower of Christ from that context, it's like deserting your family. It's like walking away from your community. It's like put, getting into a new foreign religion. And so because of that, there's persecution. And so I had to take Hussein with me, and Hussein stayed with me for, for uh, about five years. So I took him to school to start learning language because he's from the rural area. And right now Hussein has his own family and is following Jesus. And so the church became an important component of a sustaining through uh, through persecution. In, when people describe Kenya, they describe Kenya as a Christian nation. In, 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 in Kenya, persecution are in pockets. It's not like generally happening. We, you have, you have it, it's, it's kind of a popping up persecution because of the activity of outreaches. Or, and so the, the major issues is it's excommunication. And, and, and people believe, and they are excommunicated. And uh, because, because also the, the persecutors know that you cannot go beyond some limits because there's a law in the country. But within family, it is a, a serious case. It happens. I have a lot of cases that I have profiled in our ministry, and we, keep, we, have, we try to respond. The other one, he came to believe uh, through one of our workers. Uh, he had somebody was sharing uh, about Jesus. He, he told him, I heard uh, you telling that person about Jesus. Please, can you tell me? Because I have been thinking about this. I want to know more. And, uh, and of course, in their discussion, later on he gave his life to Jesus. But he was also severely persecuted. The family took away his wife. They took away his child. Uh, he lost his job. They need a shoulder, somebody to shoulder them, somebody to cry with them, somebody to identify with their pains. Because there are not so many people who are there for believers from the background of other faith. When they go through that, many people abandon them. And so he went through a very painful time. And uh, so he, he, now I also took him in. So I had to disciple him and I had to walk with him in the journey. So it was a very long journey. And I think I'm in this until the Lord comes. If the Lord tarries or calls me home, I'll be part of the church that is being persecuted. The church and the South not educated so well on how to respond to, to help people to respond or how themselves they can respond to that. My focus is this week, church that cannot help itself. And that's where my all efforts are.
I'm trusting God for the 300 of the same kind of people. Most of them have no Jesus option. Most of them are going, undergoing persecution. And, and so God calling to us is as we make disciples, as we take the, the as, as, as we, we take the gospel to them, the rivers that flows, uh, God wants to heal their wound as well. And so my ministry has coupled with making disciples and, and, and caring for their needs and caring for the believers, and especially those who are going through hardship in their faith, that they can get comfort, they can get encouragement uh, while they follow and pursue the forgiveness of their sin, because that's what is important. And out of the Muslim background believers in the church, the church grew. I started sending missionaries from that place. Our mission started out of that place. And so uh, today, obviously, that mission has changed the face of Northern Kenya. There is no tribe in Northern Kenya right now that is not engaged with the gospel through the teams of people that I trained and sent out. But I will, I will encourage people to pray for the weaker body of Christ. And it's time for the body of Christ to identify, to raise up and identify the way to pray, the way to go there, the way to encourage, and the way to voice, because some of these people who are going through this uh, difficult time have no voice. Secondly, pray that the community of believers will raise in the same area so that they can support each other for people who are believing. Pray for all those things that God will provide to them so that they will not give up on their faith. I'm not